Uh, nice to be here. Thank you for this amazing, um, yeah, get together. Ivan, Derek, Chris. Uh, what I'm going to do is give you a walkthrough into where and how I got towards playing with oscilloscopes via processing and development of this library, XY Scope, and sort of its process in the path of searching for other alternative displays away from the laptop screen. Uh, so as much as I love what our screens offer and they get more and more retina and they become beautiful for our photos, uh, I just get more and more frustrated seeing creative code, things in processing on the exact same display that I look at email, web browsing, photos on. And it was, uh, yeah, only a few years into getting into programming that I realized um, I've sort of seen what this screen is doing. I want to see it in some other way. I was also so digital, I was thinking, wow, everything is living in this box. Uh, what can we see outside of it? Uh, so a few years later, around 2010 or so, uh, friends in Basel on Def uh, introduced me to a thermal printer that they had in their studio and showed you could easily program it using serial commands, eventually getting a newer one where you can just uh, yeah, send PDFs with a Mac driver. But that introduced a possibility of getting out of the computer into some other alternative display, uh, in this case thermal, where it's, it's only burning the paper. You have 80-meter long rolls of paper that cost $2 a piece, and the only consumable is the paper. Uh, you can just sort of, it heats it up instantly, and so... I spent yeah a number of years uh, still am exploiting and playing with what that means, uh, having a long scroll print. Around the same time, uh, I found a, a old Draftmaster from the 80s that an architect student was selling when they moved, and saw you could also program this with serial, and thought, wow, this is a really neat kind of display. I can visualize audio uh, as a spiral and sort of try to see how the waves look like. And the minute the pen went over one spot twice, it was something totally different than the screen showed because then all of a sudden it was a little denser, a little bit darker. And if you screwed up or you were doing too often in the center, it ripped through the paper, which was really nice. And um, yeah, just started to, to walk me down this line of, okay, I'm doing these. This was sort of maybe the first vector output that I was able to find or play with. So, did I skip one? Nope. Goes on to that. Yeah, then there was the infamous video, Uscope, on YouTube. Uh, it would have been really fun if we could have brought this previous teenager, now a grown adult, uh, to this festival as well. I'm curious what they're doing now. They had an online alias. I don't know if I know the actual name. Maybe I did look it up once. Uh, and they put this video up, which was just blew me away from the demo scene, that they could have graphics and moving images uh, on this glowing green screen, which I had probably seen from the movies, but hadn't really encountered in person. Um, and that just sort of hung out back there for a while, thinking, okay, what is that? That's an interesting display. Um, kind of forgot about it. Uh, until, yeah. My girlfriend, partner, Stephanie Breuer, who joins us in Ljubljana tomorrow, uh, had done a research paper with Wolfgang Ernst in Berlin, and there he has the archaeology, archeolog no, media archaeology Findus, where it's a collection of about a thousand different objects, and in the seminar, students needed to go and pick two objects and research them and see what is the history of these different objects, and so she had picked a the line rider in the museum that tracks earthquake sort of movement and a brown tube, a CRT. And uh, yeah, so that probably sparked looking into this technology again, uh, eventually going on eBay and buying a cheap one with a couple broken bits. And here just plugging a little keyboard, like a Casio keyboard, going through some chorus to find out that's how I could get a stereo signal out of it playing with reverb, uh, so audio effects were amazing to get different shapes to happen. And thinking, yeah, this is not quite in that realm of drawing on it, like I had seen on YouTube, but was fascinating. And then I think kind of put it off on the side and went back to thermal uh, explorations, thermal printing. Uh, I had at the same, I mean, I had been constantly following online different activities and different tutorials that were out there. There was how to draw an umbrella 
which was awesome. Totally threw me in some weird directions trying to read their instructions, and they showed they had made a tool to sort of go from SVG and export the audio file, and they described how to do it, and it didn't make any sense. I kind of played a little bit in processing, uh, didn't get anywhere. I tried sort of drawing these waveforms as two oscillators, didn't get an umbrella. Uh, then, of course, there were these great examples that popped up on the internet, how to draw mushrooms, drawing Quake, and it just sort of kept reiterating this, it's possible, it's out there. Um, I was, yeah, kind of stupid and didn't just spam and write emails and saying, tell me how you do this, I should have, but was also kind of like, I don't know if it was, uh, yeah, partial, I hope I could solve this uh, on my own, slash... Yeah, I don't need to bother those people. And also, he described, uh, Chris explains exactly how to do it, but it still didn't quite make sense to me. Uh, and in the Quake, it was also a great tutorial, but it, it sort of didn't solve this crucial question of how do you get this line into an audio form uh, to get the image back. So I was playing with other displays, had found just a cheap old TV at a flea market that they just gave away because it was kind of space. And it was nice just passing a roster image, a composite video into this and seeing some warmth to the lines and the glow and uh, the artifacts, the wiggles and such, and, and just thought that was quite an interesting way of, of visualizing my website and some of the programmed graphics, but I knew it wasn't really the vector graphic that I was programming. Uh, about the same time Stephanie had started her PhD, looking into experimental filmmakers from the, around the late 40s and 50s who were using the oscilloscope oscillographics to make experimental films. And so as she was researching uh, which main people to, to look into for that work, we were talking about these forms that they were doing and how did they create these Lijou curves. Uh, some of them are much more obvious than others. Some of them have been uh, composited or, yeah, it was sort of uh, uh, a big question. How are they making those forms? And, yeah, Lijou curves. Uh, where, I mean, you can find tables that tell you it's a two-to-one ratio, it's a three-to-one ratio, but then you get into phase and that, shifts the whole image from what you think is a given ratio. Uh, so as a gift, went and got a proper oscilloscope uh, because the previous one I had was sort of broken. I felt a little guilty that uh, it costs like nothing. It was the gas to go pick it up in Switzerland and thought, okay, I should also, whoop, I should also, um, all right, free glitches. Uh, I thought I should also get maybe a function generator or two to be able to try and recreate these Lijou curves. And started looking on eBay, what, what are function generators, like what options are there. There's all kinds of amazing retro ones. There are little ones made with Arduino and quickly realized I could probably program one because it's basically two oscillators. And so I made a tool called Lijou. And one of the things that I wanted to have in such a tool to look for these patterns was a more intuitive way of searching between these two oscillators. Normally, with a function generator, you'd have to know the exact frequency you want, and you could punch in a number or say a little bit more, a little bit less. And here I just made a XY plot and said you could move the mouse left and right to adjust one of those, one of those frequencies up and down for the other, and you could go to much higher ranges as well, and you could load and save settings like a pretzel or a... This was sort of the idea of reverse engineering some of these drawings that you find in the films. The pretzel saw. Yeah, and this was, it, it was an interesting step towards this reverse engineering, but it still wasn't the drawing that was like this holy grail of, of trying to get to. Um, and so we made this tool, played with it, explored some of these images, and then it kind of sat aside because uh, I was really got into lasers. I have this uh, ADOS, um, attention deficit, no, OS, yeah, O shiny. And just quickly sort of my attention jumps from one kind of technology to another. And as a kid, um, had gone to a technology museum, seen laser demonstrations, really wanted to get into the pocket laser, some kind of laser. 
uh, ended up getting this, a laser FX, which is not a laser. Uh, as as deceiving as the package and the naming is, it's a really, I, I forget the exact technology of light, but it's maybe a, a Xion, Xion. It's a really bright bulb inside that's um, passing different color filters, and that beam is being focused onto a little mirror that's hooked up to probably a transducer to shake it with the audio input. Um, so here's a little demo that you can find online of it, and it was amazing. It would just rattled this little mirror and gave you Lija Zhu patterns on the, the wall. And that was probably a big inspiration as a kid, uh, having to open up the tape deck and get a RCA plug going out of it so that we could plug it into this thing. This isn't my video, it's just uh, someone who I think was selling one on eBay wanting to demonstrate what the thing did. And yeah, it wasn't really a laser, but they're amazing visualizations and it would change color based on the, the tone coming inside of it. Uh, yeah, around 2015 or so, I got to experience uh, some of Robert's performances, first in Node Festival for Lumiere 2, and then a little while later, Deep Web in Berlin. And it instantly convinced me the quality of light was something so different than I had seen in video projectors. Um, yeah, it was just after trying to see code also in projection mapped and such, I was, there was a certain intensity of light to the beamer that a, a laser surpassed. And so I was really interested, could we combine these two? Because a laser, of course, has the problem that it has a certain amount of lines that it can draw, whereas a video projector is as many pixels as it, the resolution has. So I started wondering, what if we sort of had a video projector and a one-to-one -one mapped laser on top, which I just learned the other night, is sandwiching. Uh, I didn't know that term, so I went to Photon Lexicon and asked in the forum, does someone have a tip for how to do real-time laser graphics combining laser projector and video projector? And the answer was, yes, there's this package made for uh, real professional laser shows with prepared video that's quite expensive. There's maybe a VJ software that can sort of do this solution. A lot of people said, I want to do it. I haven't had the time, uh, but it's on there. And then uh, later after proposing some of these things. Someone started to, to pass some video that they did years ago, but it wasn't such a commercial project that their clients wanted, and so it was kind of a one-time experiment for, for a big project. So this was the general idea. Then I started talking uh, to people who could introduce me to lasers. Robert Seidel uh, had played and told me about an EtherDream DAC as a way to program it. Luckily, I got into lasers late enough that Memo Atkin, among others, had started to build up libraries and open frameworks to control the EtherDream DAC as well as uh, generate real-time this ILDA commands to feed it. And so I got a fairly cheap laser, put it next to a beamer, and did some really crude experiments at the beginning, uh, testing out sending things from processing and sort of recreating the shapes that you would have in processing a square, a circle, a line, and passing them with OSC to uh, open frameworks where I basically translated those drawings and coordinates back to the primitive shapes for the laser. And it's, yeah, I got to also experience how fast could I go or should I go and, and trying to get a little bit more and more precise. Uh, I had already kind of started the initial of this code that I needed because when feeding the plotter with processing, I'd rebuilt a line, a rectangle, a circle as little sort of pseudo functions that became complex shapes. So sort of redrawing those shapes and just saying, I think I put a P underscore in front of all of them so I could send it to the plotter and not the screen. And then, yeah, started testing out uh, feeding it type using nice wing bats. And I mean, here it's kind of a funny example because this probably, with a good laser, could also be all done with laser because I'm still drawing lines. I was just interested in what happens if it's too many lines versus just a few lines to highlight. And another reason I was getting into the laser was I'm um, teaching uh, in Basel, teaching design students creative code and trying to get them programming as an alternative or parallel to, to using other packages. And in the bachelor first year, they take sort of all the courses, and then the second year they choose to focus on image type or new media. 
And so I'm an advocate and, and try to push, take new media. You can do type and image in this as well. And lasers are quite sexy. And so it's um, not, yeah, a little bit of gimmick, but a little bit like saying there's, there's so many other technologies that we can look at what we create on, and this is one of them. So it began by, by extending that, that plotter code that I had done and just sort of recreated the basic shapes in processing where you just put an X in front of it. And then that code went off to this open frameworks panel with OSC. So the students, I could teach them basic programming, primitive shapes, some complex, uh, or not complex, some, some interesting um, yeah, sign functions, breaking down type and particularly playing with audio reactive quality, so analyzing audio in different ways and having that influence the shapes. And they could focus on that aspect of it and then put an X in front of any of the shapes that should get sent off to the laser and figure out what limitations there were for how many should be drawn. Uh, so we did a, yeah, so the end project, it's, it's great that the class is 25 people, so I can give everyone a letter on the keyboard and that's who they represent. I get to be with letter Z and sometimes an extra letter if there's not quite 25 people. And then we have sort of a, a yeah, a DJ or mix going on and someone has a wireless keyboard and gets to sort of play VJ switching between the letters and everyone had to figure out, yeah, what to do with their letter and making it audio reactive. Uh, the audio that we hear isn't, isn't, used for the actual recording, so I don't need to play it. Uh, but it was an interesting lesson for them, also in reduction, because at first they want to send everything to the laser, or they want to move it super far and wide, and then they hear it squealing, and I say, like, stop, stop, stop. And uh, then they figure out, okay, maybe I only need this one line in this one color, and I can also get what I'm looking for. Or once we get to R, they were sort of pushing the boundary, and their letter was collapsing on them, which was also a really interesting quality that they hadn't anticipated. Yeah, just go through the alphabet and then I'll switch. seen the form on itself based on the sound. And luckily a third of the students went and chose to do new media, so it worked. Uh, so that was sort of a, a distraction into lasers, and then at about the, yeah, a little bit, no, just before this, uh, Stephanie and I gave a workshop in Bremen on audiovisuality, where she did the theory and I taught processing, and someone was getting interested in wavetable generation, and so showed them the basics that I knew in Minim how to do that, and then after the workshop thought, hey, we just played with wavetables, maybe I should try this again. Uh, this drawing thing. And so here I show you a few of those failed attempts from a couple years ago. Uh, it was fun looking back at these things and just seeing the timestamp as well for what was being tried and what day and trying a little bit later and then the next day coming back to it. And it's also fun now knowing more code than I did two years ago where I can quickly see what weird thing I was doing wrong. I mean, uh, the most crucial in the first attempt was reading the screen like pixels. I was still in a roster mindset while trying to draw a vector graphic. I was sort of analyzing every pixel from left to right, top to bottom, and saying, if you're bright, you should go into the audio form, and if you're not, you shouldn't, and somehow I'll get my vector image, and that didn't work. Uh, then I tried getting an image just by changing the frequency of oscillator. That didn't work. Then I came really close, but somehow it looked nothing. It didn't look right at all on the oscilloscope. Uh, but somehow got a really blocky, low-res version of it, but it didn't work, so it kind of got 
forgot I was probably because I was playing with phase and had no idea what I was doing with phase at the time. Uh, and then about half a year later, opened up again another attempt and thought maybe I should just try playing with these wavetables and see if I could get some of these shapes to appear and got interesting things to happen, but not quite the shape. And then I saw a great talk by Jus van Rossum uh, from a -E, where he as a type designer was really interested what do letters sound like? So he was converting type into the letter form. He He's the maker of Drawbot um, and has a type foundry letter. And he was converting uh, his just letter forms into a waveform to then, into a wave file, uh, audio file, to look at on the oscilloscope and see what did Comic Sans sound like? What did uh, Serif sound like? So that was some inspiration of another way of doing it. And at the same time, my students for a workshop had wanted to bring him to Basel for giving a workshop in this Drawbot tool because they were curious, what can that tool do? So when he was there, uh, we talked about oscilloscopes and he brought his uh, wave files over and we checked it out looking through different audio effects and just sort of seeing how can you bend the type? What is that sounding like? I showed Lizajou what I was attempting to do with uh, with those XY oscillators. And then we went to dinner, and on the walk to dinner was describing this problem, like I've been trying to draw X and Y. Um, I'm trying to draw on the oscilloscope. I'm doing something wrong. I don't know what it is. And he had such a clear way of explaining it because he has a mathematician background and is amazing at explaining complex things in a really simple way. And he just said, the left audio channel is your X movement from left to right. The right audio channel is your vertical movement up and down. And I don't know why. I mean, that's super obvious, I think, to most of the people in this room or you've, you've discovered this through doing this process. Uh, but somehow I didn't read that instruction in any of the tutorials I had looked at before. It needed like a fourth person to explain it in yet another way to get it. Uh, so that was amazing, just sort of walk in thinking like, duh, okay. So then we had dinner and I was thinking, uh, yeah, this is great. Yep, really nice talking. And uh, no, then it was exciting afterwards to run back to my code and see like, okay, with that idea, what can I change uh, to get it right? And then, of course, it worked. Um, I just show a demonstration of what this means. So I'm moving from left to right, and I'm of course just affecting the left audio channel. Yeah, we have this. I'll do that sort of mix. Maybe. If I go up and down, we have just the right. And here I'm just showing you the waveforms, uh, like the wavetables that I'm generating in XY scope to demonstrate. So all my vertical movements are on that channel. I make a diagonal and we get to see them both move. Or I make a square and we see one of them move. Then we get to see the other. And then we get to see also, yeah, making some complex form and hearing it as well. So that was huge. Um, it immediately opened up. Okay, the the gate had been opened up now of of translating these these vector points and and paths to their their left and right channels using. Yeah, I'm using a wave table, so I'm translating across the whole shape and was in the first version just mapping it out across each of the the slices of the wave table. I was using 512 pieces, and so it was quite blocky. And yeah, there's lots of things I learned over time. Eventually I figured out I was really sitting on the dots and then running to the next dot and sitting on that dot, then running and turn that off. And then later in a workshop, I left it in the code and someone put it back as a prefer dot version instead of smooth line version. So I don't need to really uh, change anything. So I started playing with this and also passing it through every audio effect uh, that I had that would play along nicely started playing with type, because in processing you have all these other libraries that are great to play with. Uh, Geom, Geom, Geomerative for SVGs and type, getting the points out of those. Uh, here playing with SVGs, 
dragging those in and then just having fun expanding them in three-dimensional space per shape. Uh, playing with a connect and testing what's that like to, to knock out the background and just have a certain shape. And this is when I started using OpenCV, which uh, the, the connect has this great depth camera, and so it can give you this grayscale image of how far away things are. Then you can flatten that with threshold and make it a black and white image. And then you could take that image and in OpenCV have it trace the contours of it and quickly run into the traveling salesman problem of not being efficient at all and just having it run all over the place. Uh, yeah, did really amateur dancing while testing out different audio effects on it. What did low pass filters do? What did sort of uh, cutoffs do? And all along the way, I was just copying and pasting these li these like code from one sketch to another, sort of deleting everything I had in a previous sketch, copying it to a new one, trying out something else, and realizing, ooh, I had a new feature. Crap, I need to go back and change all the other ones. So obvious thing to do is make a library where then you have the central repository to reference to. Uh, I mean, I was benefiting so much from the processing community and all the libraries that people have contributed for physics, for... Yeah, for everything, animation, uh, 3D, uh, stereo, stereography, et cetera. And so I had to figure out how to do that. And the first thing you do, like when you form a band, is figure out what to call the thing. And so these are some really uh, pretty crappy names amongst there. For the longest time, it was going to be XY Tools, because I thought, uh, yeah, it's the XY is the most important. The Z is, is also important, and eventually settled on XY Scope. And, yeah, released it. Um, ah, there's a nice little Easter egg in here. Because I did a bad job recording the video, the trailer audio, so it, was, it wasn't it was DC coupled when I recorded the trailer. So I couldn't use it for the video and then decided, okay, let's just have a different soundtrack over the top. So in the box, it comes with um, yeah, sort of a drawing example. Yeah. Uh, webcam. No, sorry, a connect. A webcam. That one is uh, then a webcam. Doing this open CV translation. And a clock, which is super useful to stay on time. Yeah. So I put it uh, out there just to to help the person that was me like a couple years earlier who who really wanted to do this and couldn't find the starting point. Uh, and I just want to demonstrate just a couple of the things in it. Uh, I mean, here it's about eight lines of code to, to call the library and then to say, okay, I want to clear the waves, build the waves, draw me all this debug information, and just keep adding points. And because I'm teaching with processing all the time, it's the same idea that I was explaining before, where I wanted to keep it as simple as possible, that you know these basic primitive shapes, and all you would need to do is put the, the sort of reference to the library in front of it. You could call it anything you want, but I'd suggest x, y, dot. Um, yeah, and this is a dangerous slide to show because there's so many more tools than are on here. But at the time, these were sort of the the places that I was looking and seeing. These are other tools that are out there. There had been the, a microcontroller being made for doing MAME emulation. There was Aussie Studio. And then, yeah, thanks to Joost, uh suggesting to go talk to or to check out video circuits and Chris for having video circuits, then it put me in touch with the whole community and quickly learning how many other uh, tools were out there and how many people were were exploring this as well. Uh, one of the first projects or pings back that I got in response to it was from Jenkin Pop, who thought it, he took my webcam example and thought, oh, this would be great to hook up to Siphon, this, this way of passing video textures around the Mac. And he knew that OpenEMU is always sending a Siphon out from it. So he said, let's play Super Mario Brothers on an oscilloscope. He didn't have an oscilloscope, so he used my crappy uh, built-in debug of it. 
Yeah, and one of the things that became really interesting in doing that is figuring out... Um, let me just open that up real quick. Siphon... Open EMU. Let's play with like Rad Racer. Uh, okay. Yeah, one of the interesting things about trying to play a video game through this technique is you have to figure out which shapes to focus on based on the background. Ooh, unknown error inside the controller. Do I have anything else open? Nope. Want, want, want. Let's force quit and reopen it. So this is the original image that's being passed through with the siphon. And then this is the, the very first, like converting it to a threshold, as well as doing a bit of expanding of those pixels to try to make it easier for it to, to cover up. And then it's a really interesting game of figuring out where exactly should this threshold take place to see your image. And of course you have to start playing to first see the car and say, okay, do I see the car? Yes, somewhere here. There we go. Okay. And, yeah. And then it's a question of seeing the other cars and finding just the optimal place uh, that it needs to be in order to see the game. The game to be way further down. Oh well. Don't need to demonstrate that. One of the fun things is also using a browser through Siphon, and so you can technically browse websites through through this code, uh, but that doesn't look so nice. And we thought, yeah, we need to make a special controller for playing video games, where while you're playing the game, you constantly adjust the threshold and try to see what level you're on. And if you want to see the Goombas or the pipes, you have to adjust it. Uh, let's see, I think I'm going to show a couple of ways that I've used XY Scope since... Uh, one of the first things I was doing with it was trying to make exhibitions with it. So this was in a, a window in Basel that sat right next to a hamburger restaurant. And I was playing with the Google Quick Draw data. It's this data, this online game, playing with artificial intelligence. They ask you, draw me a shoe. And then you have 20 seconds to draw a shoe, and it tries guessing what you're drawing. And it says, I see a fence, I see a house, oh, I know it's a shoe. And after six months, they gave away the data. Or they gave out the data set they had thus far, which was 50 million drawings, for about 300 objects. And so I looked up hamburgers, and there were about 200,000 hamburgers that people had drawn from all around the world. And I thought it'd be really nice. People could sit in front of this window, eat a hamburger, because they put the tables just in front of the window. And then every time a hamburger finished, it printed it out on this long scroll that grew and grew like in the kitchen. And it was really nice just to see how do people draw hamburgers around the world. So that was the first iteration. The second iteration was saying, ooh, in this data set, they also tell you if it's not recognized. There's a true or false if the object was detected. So I thought it'd be really interesting to pick objects that we don't have photographic proof for, like a mermaid, a dragon, an angel, and a UFO. No, did I say that already? Yeah. So these four objects, we don't have photographic proof. They probably exist, but we don't know exactly what they look like. And it was really interesting that Google said, no, that's not a dragon. And what to do with the computer? You either hide it somewhere, or I usually like to try and show a debug view to give some idea of what the process is, the line, the waveform, the audio, and then the final drawing. Uh, around the same time, I was also preparing to be part of Typo Janji uh, in Seoul, which is a typographic biennale that was focused on body. And they were interested to have as many oscilloscopes as possible. So I said, I think we could do eight, maybe, five to ten, I don't know. And so I started 
getting some cheap ones on eBay, thinking maybe we shipped these over because they were having a really hard time finding them, which surprised me. And then they found someone who could rent them, uh, eight almost identical, but it was really nice that they all had slightly different phosphorescent, phosphor, yeah, phosphorescent coatings. And I spent the summer researching how to make an oscilloscope big. Uh, a laser is the uh, is like a good answer, um, but I was curious: is there a nice way that we can just take this small, intense image and enlarge it? And so I was playing with Fresno lenses at different depths, and was getting pretty good results of up to about a meter by a meter at not such a far distance. But it depended on the room being completely dark, or like really, really dark. So I went through with the plan and built little frames to hold the lenses in front of the scopes. And they really had the idea, yes, we're going to have big oscillographics and we're not going to use rescanning. And this was their idea of, of projecting them onto these surfaces. And they made renderings of sort of the idea of how it could be. It's in a former train station. And it took about like half a second of being in the space and seeing how much other light there was that it, this isn't going to work. Because... Uh, they had light on the sides. They had light coming in. There's this wall here. I mean, besides the lights that are turned on, when those were off, there was still light climbing over this wall on the ceiling. They had tried to put some tarp but didn't have enough. So it was just light from everywhere, and I realized this isn't going to work. I had to convince them. I felt really bad that uh, we're not going to have big oscillographics. But I had already had the experience that people like to get up close to these things, that it's a small display, and it's also really interesting for a visitor to say, like, come check out this intense... Uh, light and so I said I think it'll work and uh, yeah it was it was fine people there were these different stations I'll show you a little bit of what four of the stations were and people just sort of came up and gathered around and then went from one to the other and one of the main installations there was called also body also typo because it's a typographic biennale and it was about the body and so what I did is I used a connect and had someone walk in at the first station and it took about a two second buffer of what they were doing in front of the screen and the minute they walked out of it it just kept playing this buffer throughout all the other displays until someone else came in and recorded over what they had done so then it passed their image here where it was their body plus different letter forms that alternated at a really high frequency and a small amplitude so you could see the action you had just done with sort of a contour of letters then it was flipped, and on the third one you saw a letter form with your action, really tiny, modulated on top or, or additive on top of there. So if you did different wave movements, you could really see yourself on there. And there was also a soundtrack, an attempt at a soundtrack, playing with a pentatonic scale, and so they could shift in different um, octaves on certain notes and sort of create a, a, a soundscape. And in the last one, you saw yourself again in that final buffer. And it was also a great place to stand and sort of watch people interacting with it without being observed. You sort of kept seeing this little loop of what they had just this done. This computer here. And there was also the debug view there to make sure that people sort of saw what they were doing. It showed your body, the type, the lines, etc. Uh, there's Greta, which has its last... Uh, evening tonight and sort of the main piece being shown there is playing with the Vectrex and uh, having a random walker in three-dimensional space. So it's it's sort of uh, exploring space and for me with this process in XY scope it's really easy to play with three dimension because everything uh, similar to what I think Chris mentioned in the last was uh, I flatten this and ask where are you in a two-dimensional field even though you have three dimensions just give me your XY position and so all the drawings can be in any depth, and in the end we'll get a flat image. Uh, yeah, speaking of the Vectrex, we've been talking about it the last week. Um, it took a while to finally say, let's check out what that display is, because the oscilloscope had been quite a, enough, and uh, got one and then learned, heard about modding them, and I was scared, sort of crapless, of should I open this thing up and touch it? Uh, probably from Andrew's PDF that had the second image showing uh, this great danger of death. It did a good job of, of warning me, and so I went to an electrician that's close to my studio and, and said, what do you think, and opened it up and just went tap, 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 dip. No, it's fine, but I still didn't quite trust it, so kept looking up other PDFs and double-checking that, okay, am I going to do this right and the, the best way, because there's all this uh, expanded knowledge of 
this is a nice mod, this is a nice mod. I'd seen Bainbridge's switching jacks and thought, yeah, I really like the the games and carts that are on there, so that's something I need to add and sort of combine those together. And yeah, we've all seen the, the inside of that, adding these jacks. And then had to add a little mode to XY scope for the Vectrex, where you just say, I want to use a Vectrex, and you tell it which rotation you're using, 0, 90, negative 90. And then it nicely scales the things for it. Um, yeah, and then it opened up, okay, this other kind of display. And then, thankfully, yeah, Derek and Fred Konoska uh, figured out this spot killer. And I was also lucky that I kind of got into this just a little bit later. And so this research had just been done and didn't have to suffer too much from where's my image going. But it's really interesting. I, was, uh, I like these other hacks that you could send a really high frequency and somehow bypass it. Uh, so did it once on a yeah sort of a backup cheap one I'd found and then was interested to have it on and off because sometimes you want with the games you don't want to see it with the your own stuff you of course do so I bought as safe a switch as I could find 15 amp with rubber coating thinking if I shock myself that might protect me and thought where do I hide this thing and found the reset button might be a nice place because uh, yeah and I've never had to reset the Vectrex you can just turn it on and off and was amazed how perfect the switch fit in there and thought, wow, this is made to be, and then realized it's not a long enough switch and it's just this little dinky thing uh, that you won't be able to use. So then decided, okay, it'll go on the top and be part of the other jacks and be clear it's on and off. Uh, yeah, so then this was just like a, yeah, a week ago before coming here to, to be able to have this on and off for the piece in Greta and thought, yeah, it's also amazing. We got to see this the other day just turning that off with some of the default imagery. I love what happens to the text and just seeing their process. It also does a nice job of reverse engineering some of the paths that they're taking. Um, yeah, borrowing equipment from the university to try and make uh, short little films, trying to figure out what do I want to do with these also graphics and or vector graphics and still trying to explore what that is. This is the the work that's inside of Greta, and so it's recorded once as about a two-minute film, but I think it's interesting that it can also live in a generative sense uh, and constantly be slightly changing. So it's almost the loop, what's in Greta, but it um, it's following the frame count, so its random seed is always a little bit different, and the piece will, will always have slight variations if it's, if it's displayed on it. Uh, what kind of things are coming? Multiplexing if I'm using the right word, is always trying to get better of just having multiple shapes. Since I'm attaching them to a wavetable that becomes the oscillator, it's always a question of getting quickly from one point to another. Building little synth, synth tools has been interesting, trying to make a, a drawing to MIDI keyboard. Uh, the next step is playing with the laser from going from the Motu out to the ILDA interface and revisited Lisa Zhu, and now call it Lisa Zhu, for having eight channels, um, which is, yeah, a student introduced me to this great mixer. I've seen it already out on the field. And it has motorized controls, which was really nice for being able to sort of keep some presets and recall them. So when it arrived in the mail, one of the first fun things to do was to sort of test out uh, what those motorized faders can do, and it's really nice having little sine waves on there and still have to figure out how to have that sort of be a possessed machine. Um, yeah, the next step is sort of hooking this up also to a Vectrex, and so it's sort of doing its own thing, and things are changing on the Vectrex, and we'll sort of wonder who, what is controlling this. And it's also interesting testing the speed of these things and how they handle getting faster and faster and faster. It goes faster and faster, but I'll save you the time. <laughs> um, yeah, so Lisa Zhu as a side tool is sort of, it's a really simple tool of just having eight oscillators. Uh, let me do a switch back to here, where I can just sort of, on each of them, give them a pan, or give them an amplitude, pan them in either direction, 
give them a different waveform. I'll leave it on sign for now and set its frequency. So maybe I'll start it just at a little rate, give it another one at the opposite. Also slow it down a bit. Ah, we got some sound. We don't have some sound. Ah, because it's on such a low frequency. What? Yeah, and so to me, what was quite interesting is them getting to play with additive synthesis inside of there, and sort of adding. Um, yeah, let me reset it one more time and just make a simple circle, and add one more on a certain side. Add another frequency. And this will be. Yeah, something to try and play with in Ljubljana um, as sort of an improvising tool for, for different waveforms. And this is where it's interesting to mix with XY scope of sort of saying, okay, let's have a type example. If I turn these down and just say, hello, let's spell it correct. back up yep. I mean the other steps with XY scope is mixing it with MIDI control so here I think I just wanted to show, yeah, a, another little example playing with XY scope was feeding animation into it, testing out, ooh, La Linea works, and then it was really fun to add their own audio over it, and this is something else to keep exploring, is letting the audio of a given video distort its own image. XY scope it comes with the whole examples on the side and I'll just demonstrate maybe one of them with the type for example let me just add higher rate and what's uh, a nice inside of processing is some of these things like three dimension or rotating qualities you can just add with a uh, saying we're going to play in three dimensional space and let's rotate on a y axis. This is old code. just start to make yeah just little bits uh, on top of what that code is so it's sort of the basic building blocks in playing with uh, a webcam or a connect or a clock or a 3d toroid use an open CV again with the webcam And I 
I think that's enough demo because I think we're really hungry. So I'll say thank you. All right. Uh, yeah, we've been going really long today. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your, your patience and attention. It's been, uh, it's been really fantastic. Are there any questions for Ted before we, uh, before we take a break? Going once. Going twice. This is also a question to you, and like I, I just was thinking about this during the talk. With we have all these softwares, but we've never spoken about like an interchange format, mm -hmm. which is maybe something we should be doing to to be able, to, because not every tool is good for every job. Yeah. Um, so maybe this would be something nice. Have you have you considered this, or have you thought about this? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great idea of of how to have them talk to each other for their ideal components, and I bet OSC is probably uh, the most convenient way, I, having experience going yeah, from processing to open frameworks that way. At the beginning, I was also thinking this would just be an engine where you constantly send OSC to it. There are limitations for the speed or the length of a message, so maybe it, I don't know if it's the best format, but well, I maybe could... Maybe we should try to figure something out. Yeah. The right. oscilloscope tool language. Or something. <laughs> in, uh, uh, one of the impressive things um, that uh, Hansi didn't show in um, in Oski Studio is this uh, this uh, this uh, link up with Blender that you can be mm. working on Blender models in real time and be able to work to be able to bring them like directly uh, from from the Blender window essentially into into Oski Studio, which is, I found really impressive and certainly and, and and I don't know how you do that and I don't think that that's uh, I don't think that that's something that OSC would be maybe ideal for either. I'm not sure. So, huh? TCP. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So yeah, it's yeah. That's definitely stuff we should talk about. But maybe that could even be a little discussion that we have um, by Sunday or something. Mm -hmm. So, great. Okay. Anything else from our esteemed audience members? Ah. I've been looking uh, at the uh, at your website before, and um, is XY Scope available? Because I couldn't find the download link. Yeah, it's um, this guy. Okay. XY Scope. Yeah, it's probably a small link on the the website. Yeah, you find it that way, or you also find it if you're inside processing. Um, type in the libraries XY Scope, and then you can download it from within processing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you.